Joy in the city. Joy in your life. Joy in your family. And joy everywhere in Jesus' name. GCK Authority has announced the next level move. From the land of honor and integrity comes two in one GCK live in Ekiti State, Southwest Nigeria, the Global Crusade and Retreat, December 22 to 27, 2022. A new level of Impact Academy for Youth, Young Adults and Professionals, titled Recharge to Excel, December 27, 2022, at 0600 hours GMT, all broadcasts live on satellite, radio, television, and all our social media platforms with Jonathan White, our guest music minister. GCK, the gospel to every creature. Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight to study your word. We know your word was given by the inspiration of the Spirit of God. And we can only understand as you assist us and enlighten us through the Holy Ghost. We are pleading and praying tonight that you will grant us enlightenment in the Holy Ghost so that we will understand your word in Jesus' name. And we pray that your word will fall on fertile ground so that it will bring forth fruit that will be pleasing unto you. In Jesus' name we pray. Today we're studying the study of the epistle of Paul, the apostle to the Colossians. And today we have the introductory study. We're looking at Colossians chapter 1 now, verses 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. As we look at this epistle, and we look at the introductory message today, we'll try to cover the introduction and the purpose for which the epistle was written. And as we look at the purpose for which the epistle was written, you will see the purpose while we're studying the epistle itself. Colossae was a city in the greater Phrygia um, section or region, not far from Laodicea and Hierapolis. These three cities, Colossae, Laodicea, and Hierapolis, formed a sort of triangle in the region of Asia Minor. And even though Paul preached the gospel in many parts of Phrygia, that is, many parts of Asia Minor, he never had the opportunity of being at Colossae itself. Colossae received the gospel by the preaching of Epaphras and other teachers of the word of God who had been with Paul the Apostle, who had received the gospel from Paul the Apostle. And at the time this epistle was written, Epaphras was with Paul, at the place it was written. The Holy Spirit has given us this epistle through the hand of Paul for a purpose. It was an age of science, and there was a likelihood of the danger that confusion will come in to Colossae and the Colossian church by philosophic ideas opposed to the Christian gospel. There was also the danger of ecumenism, Judaism, Edenism, and the brand of Christianity they had received, coming to collide together, and sometimes some people thinking that there should be a margin and amalgamation. They needed an epistle like this. It was a time around Asia Minor, and around Colossae in particular, when there was resistance against every kind of authority, parental authority, Christian authority, or church authority or the authority or the control of anyone over any other person. And Paul the Apostle needed to set things right concerning biblical scriptural authority. At the place Colossae at that time, there was something going on that is called pragmatism. That is, whatever was pragmatic or whatever works 
people wanted it. They will not think whether it was right, proper, scriptural, or not. If the thing is working, they wanted to try it. And Paul the Apostle needed to write to them from the Word of God so that they will set things right and know that even if things work, it must be right and proper before they will take it. There was also the age of frustrated relationships between parents and children, husbands and wives, servants and masters, workers and workers together, and between the brethren. And Paul the Apostle needed to set things right on what the relationship ought to be. Some were getting interested in eschatology, on the study of the last things. And to avoid confusion, Paul wrote this epistle to them. And when we live, when we look at the situation in which we live today, we know that we need to study an epistle like this. A serious study of this epistle is relevant today and is necessary as well. As I've said, we'll cover just two points today. Point one, introduction to the epistle. Point two, the purpose of the epistle. Point one. Let's look at the introduction. Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timotheus our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul the Apostle brought greetings to the believers at Colossae. He spoke about the grace of God and the peace from God. These had been brought into the gospel or brought into the fold by the grace of God. Grace unmerited. The free gift of God through Jesus Christ. This is God's riches. At Christ's expense, forgiveness, salvation, eternal life, coming to them through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because they had come into the kingdom of God by the grace of God, he now said, more grace be unto you. Called by grace, they will be kept by grace and established by grace. On the basis of how they were called, how they were being kept, they were also to have this grace multiplied unto them. Grace be unto you. They have started the Christian life by grace. And only through grace will they be able to experience greater things, deeper, richer things from the Lord. Grace be unto you. The grace that brought them in was able to keep them in the salvation of the Lord until they saw the Lord face to face. And grace will make them all that they ought to be. And through that grace, the peace of God had come to them. Before, they were sinners. They had no peace. They were torn apart. There was confusion because of the condemnation of their sin. But now grace entered and peace came. The peace of God. Being justified by faith, they had peace with God. And to continue their Christian lives so that all their hearts and souls will be guarded and controlled by the peace of God. He greeted them and said, Peace from God our Father also be unto you. He emphasized that the grace came from God our Father. The peace came through our Lord Jesus Christ. Something we need to take note of there. When you receive the grace of God, you become a child of God. And as you receive the peace of God within you, you come under the Lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ. God the Father, our Sonship. Jesus Christ, our Lord, our discipleship. So then, he is our Father, and Jesus is our Lord. This form of greeting was common to a lot of the epistles of Paul the Apostle. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and in verse 1, verses 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints which are 
in all Achaia, grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, you will see the point mentioned here. Paul, an apostle. An apostle of Jesus Christ. And it is by the will of God. He had his companion here, Timothy. And he was writing to the church of God at Corinth. And he was writing to the saints in the church. Again, he mentioned the fact that grace be unto them. And peace from God. God our Father. And Jesus our Lord. Were his children. And they were Christ's disciples. In Galatians chapter 1. Verses 1, 2, and 3. Paul, an apostle. Again, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren which are with me, unto the churches of Galatia, grace be unto you, and peace, notice it again, from God the Father, and from our Lord Jesus Christ. You cannot be a child of God without coming under the control, the lordship, and the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. So the saints which are at Ephesus, to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you, and peace from God, which God, our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. You can see that we cannot escape the fact that when we become children of God and we refer to God as our Father, we also come under the control, under the Lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's come back to Colossians chapter 1. Verses 1 and 2. In this introductory greeting of Paul the Apostle to the believers at Colossae, we see four normal elements. Element number one, the writer, Paul himself. Two, the companion, Timothy. Three, the readers, the saints and the faithful brethren at Colossae. And four, the city where the church had been planted, Colossae. Let's look at them briefly, one by one. Let's look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. What do you, we have to study about Paul, the apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ? One fact that comes out very clearly is in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16. How be it, for this cause I obtained mercy that in me first Christ Jesus might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. You may want to mark that in your Bible, that God raised up Paul the Apostle. He dealt with Paul the Apostle, not only because they wanted to make him a Christian and a minister, he wanted to have the grace of God work things out in his life that it will become a pattern. He will become a model to those that should hereafter believe on the Lord to life everlasting, which means then, since God has raised him up as a model Christian, as a model minister, as a model evangelist, pastor, and teacher, as a model apostle and prophet, as a model missionary, it's raised him up a pattern for you and for me, for those of us that will hereafter believe, we need to know something more about Paul the Apostle. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and in verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 1. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. If God has raised him up a pattern, and we ought to be followers of him as he is of Christ, then we need to know something about his life. What do we learn about his life? Just briefly tonight, we cannot learn everything about in only one study. But just briefly tonight, let's look at Acts chapter 9, reading from verse 3. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. 
And suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the priest. Remember, raised up as a pattern for those who should hereafter believe he was once a sinner. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He was going to Damascus to persecute the believers. He was against Christ. He was against the believers. He thought he was serving God when he was doing that. Many of us have gone astray. And we've gone everyone his own way, like sheep that had been lost. Many of the things we did in our simple state, we thought we were doing right. But then the Lord brought him under conviction. As he was going on the way, he fell down as this light from heaven shone over him. And then he heard the voice of the Lord saying, Why persecutest thou me? He came under conviction. He started to pray. That is, he started to talk back to the Lord. Who art thou, Lord? The Lord revealed himself unto uh, Paul, unto Saul. And in verse 6, he trembling and as he said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Here is the point, he surrendered himself unto the Lord, saying, I know that I've done wrong, but I did it innocently in unbelief, but now what will you have me to do? At that point, Christ took hold of him, called him, changed him, he became converted. He went to Damascus. What was he doing in Damascus? Verse 9. And he was three days without sight, neither did he eat nor drink. Verse 11. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayed, being under conviction because of the evil he had done, being under conviction because of his dirty life, his blasphemous life. He now started praying and calling upon the Lord. For three days and nights he did without food and without drinking anything. He was praying and fasting just before the Lord. The Lord changed him. The Lord converted him. In Acts chapter 26, Acts chapter 26 from verse 13. At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all falling to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me, saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the priest. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. But rise, stand upon thy feet. For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things which in the which I will appear unto thee. He was converted, and the Lord called him that same time. The Lord knew what he wanted to make of him. He called him to be a minister of the gospel in 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. It was the Lord himself that put Paul the apostle into the ministry. What a challenge for us, that we should wait until the Lord himself puts us into the ministry. Converted by the Lord, also called by the Lord. Converted, called, and also consecrated unto the Lord. He was so consecrated to the Lord because we read in Philippians chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. According to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death, for to me to live 
is Christ. To die is gain. He was combated soundly. He received a call from the Lord and he consecrated himself in life and death unto the Lord. Remember, is the pattern. And we are to be followers of him as he of Christ. Philippians chapter 3 from verse 7. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. What he meant is that there were a lot of things that he had in his own believing state. A lot of privileges and opportunities he had in his own believing state. And he recounted or related some of them in the epistles. And yet he said, what things were gained to me? Those I counted lost for Christ. Briefly look at Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1 verse 14. And profited in the Jews' religion above many, mine equal, in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the tradition of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb, and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. He said he could have risen to the highest position in the world. He said he could have made the greatest profit and gain in the world. But then he said, what things were gained to me? Those I counted lost for Christ. What a model, what a pattern. Can you say that? Can I say that? Can we say that all the things that should have been gained for us, that we have counted dung and dross, lost for Christ, Philippians chapter 3, verse 8. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but laws for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And do count them, but don't, that I may win Christ. Verse 7, what things were gained to me? Now, those I counted lost for Christ. Verse 8, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. And in that same verse 8, I have suffered the loss of all things. And I do count them but dung, that I may exalt Christ, that I may win Christ, that I may fulfill the purpose of Christ in my life. Let's look at Galatians chapter 6 verse 14. Correct it on your outline, not chapter 1, chapter 6, verse 14. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I to the world. You can see the consecration of this man, the Apostle Paul. The Lord met him on the way, convicted him of his sin. He surrendered unto the Lord, saying, What will you have me to do? There and then he surrendered everything in his life to the Lord. And he went on praying until the Lord touched him, changed him, molded him, and remade him all over again. And when, uh, when Paul the Apostle came out of that prayer chamber, he became a totally different person. And then he looked back and he said, All the things I ever had, all the privileges I ever had, all the intentions, ambitions, aspirations I ever had, I drop everything, like you dump everything in the drawers or in the latrine or in the pit. Because now Christ will be all and in all for him. Here is the apostle that God used, that Christ used to write this epistle to the Colossians. Now Colossians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul an apostle of Jesus Christ. An apostle is one that has an errand to run for the greater one. He had received the lordship of Christ in his life. Now he became an apostle. The saint one. He first realized that God sent him to this world for a purpose. And he made up his mind, whatever the purpose is for which God had sent him to this world, he was going to fulfill. Not only that, God had sent him into the Gentile world 
and as a saint one, an apostle, he was going to fulfill the reason why God had sent him to the Gentile world. Not only that, he had been broken away from the Jews that he actually was a part of. You know that he was a Pharisee of the tribe of Benjamin. But he pleased the Lord to take him out of the Benjamites, out of the Jews, out of the people of the circumcision, and to have his ministry among the Gentiles as the saint one, an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, I cannot choose the way I will go. I cannot choose the things I will say. I cannot choose the life I will live. I cannot choose the place I will reside. I am an apostle, a saint one, an apostle of Jesus Christ, saint by the Lord. He said he was not nominated by man. He was not voted for by man. An apostle of Jesus Christ, he became an apostle not by personal aspiration, personal ambition. That is, it wasn't that he was saying it will be a wonderful thing to be an apostle. It will be a great privilege to be an apostle. I'm aspiring to be an apostle. He said, no, not by aspiration, by the will of God. Then he said, not by usurpation. Usurpation means grabbing something, gripping something that doesn't belong to you, that doesn't belong to me. Saying, if Peter the uneducated can do it, what of me? If James and John the fishermen can do it, what of me? I am more educated. I will take that thing whether it belongs to me or not. He said, mine is not by usurpation. I'm not usurping anybody's ministry or authority or office. An apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, he said, not by nomination. The brethren at Damascus will never have nominated him. And Ananias would never have nominated him. And the people at Jerusalem, they didn't even believe he had been converted. They wouldn't have nominated him. He said, not by nomination, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. And he had a unique life, a unique consecration a unique kind of suffering and persecution, a unique kind of missionary journey, a unique kind of lifestyle, a unique kind of obedience to the Lord, a unique kind of suffering and imprisonment, a unique kind of ministry. He wrote almost half of the New Testament. God used this man to write about 14 epistles out of the 27 books of the New Testament. And God raised him up like that because he was an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, we've learned a little about Paul the Apostle. And at the bottom line of the whole thing, because you may be wondering, if a man can be like that, what kind of constitution did he have? That is, what kind of life did he have? What kind of willpower did he have? And what kind of determination did he have? Can I be a person like that? Can I do the same thing like that? Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And in verse 10, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I. But the grace of God which was with me. And you see over here, Paul the Apostle knew the efficacy or the efficiency of the grace of God in his own life. He is the one that said, not that we are sufficient to think of ourselves that we can be anything, but we are what we are by the grace of God. Our sufficiency is of God. In the trials of his life, in the problems of his life, in the things they are to go through, the Lord told him, my grace is sufficient for you. And if he was what he was by the grace of God, that grace is still available for you and for me today. Let's go on to point two of the introduction, his companion. Let us look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother. Here he wrote about Timothy, not because Timothy was a co-writer, a co-author with him of the epistle, but he was a companion. What do we know about Timothy? This Timothy had known the gospel, had known the word of God from little from a little child in second timothy chapter 3 verse 15 second timothy chapter 3 verse 15 and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in christ 
Jesus. Before he ever knew Paul the Apostle, he knew the scriptures. And these scriptures he knew if he will meditate upon them, if he will learn them, if he will pray them through, if he will give them back to the Lord and say, Lord, I know the scriptures, but I only know the letter of the scriptures. I need the enlightenment, the light shining by the Holy Ghost upon the scriptures. The scriptures were able to make him wise unto salvation. How did he know the scriptures? In 2 Timothy chapter 1 and in verse 5. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which first dwelt in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded that in thee also the scripture that he knew was not just known of head or just mentally. The grandmother had eternal life and faith in the Lord. The mother also had eternal life and faith in the Lord. And through the grandmother and the mother, they taught him to the word of salvation, the word of the Lord. And the same faith came into him as well. Eventually, he met Paul the Apostle. And he became a traveler with Paul the Apostle. He became a co-laborer with Paul the Apostle. And Paul the Apostle began to instruct him and teach him and train him like a father will train a child. And look at Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. Now therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. He became so faithful and trustworthy that whenever Paul the Apostle was not able to go to a place, Paul will send him to go and look at the people and give words of encouragement and inspiration to the people because he knew the life of Paul. He knew the ministry of Paul. He knew everything that those people will need to know about Paul the Apostle. And therefore, Paul the Apostle will send him. And when he got over there, he could give them exhortation and message and the word of life. He could look at the life of the church and bring back information, the state of the church, back to Paul the Apostle. In Philippians chapter 2, reading from verse 19. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy shortly unto you that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. But she know the proof of him, that as a son with the Father, he hath served with me in the gospel. And so this um, Timothy was a trustworthy son that was being instructed and being trained in the way of the Lord. And he was also put in charge of some part of the work of the Lord. And Paul instructed him as to how he will conduct himself, how he will live in the church of the living God. Let's look at First Timothy now, chapter 3, verse 15. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. Paul will not leave any stone unturned. He instructed this young man as to his behavior, his conduct, his life, his ministry, his teaching, everything that he will have to do. He gave him instruction and he expected that he will follow through and he will do what he told him to do. Second Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. And he thinks, with thou aside of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. At this time that Paul the Apostle wrote to the Colossians, Timothy was with him as a companion. You know, at this time that Paul the Apostle was imprisoned. And even though he was imprisoned, he had companions with him that will comfort him, that will minister to him. And he carried on the ministry of preaching the gospel and setting things right in the various churches. Let's go to the third point. The readers that Paul the Apostle wrote to. Let's see again Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae. The people that Paul the Apostle wrote to at Colossae, he described them in two ways. Number one, he described them as saints. 
Number two, he described them as faithful brethren in Christ. As you look at the construction of this sentence, saints and faithful brethren, you may think there are two groups of people. One group, saints. Second group, faithful brethren. But no. What it means here, and it comes out in the original, is saints, even the faithful brethren. You see the saints, describe them. They had had a touch of God in their lives. Therefore, they were saints of God. He said, even the faithful brethren in Christ, as Paul the Apostle described the members of the church at Colossae, in these two ways, we need to learn something about this. Number one, when God has touched your life and you have become a member of the body of Christ, you become a saint. Before you knew God, you were a sinner. From the moment you know God, you become a saint. Before your sins were forgiven, you were a sinner. When your sins are forgiven, your heart is cleansed, and your life is changed, and your life is remolded by the hand of the Lord. You become a saint. Think of it this way. A sinner comes bowed down with the burden of sin, stained with the stains of sin, and all the nature, all the life, all the language, all the, all the lifestyle, everything in his life had been stained by sin. And then he came to Calvary. And the blood of Jesus came on him and cleansed him. And the hand of the Lord picked him up, cleansed him, touched him, molded him, remade him. By the time he came out of the hand of God and he becomes a member of the church, he's no more a sinner, he's a saint. You see, the word saint is the word that is used for the real believers and the true believers in Christ throughout the New Testament. Let us look at some passages. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, verse 13. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he has done to thy saints at Jerusalem. You understand this? The people that were converted born again, children of God in Jerusalem and any other place, they are referred to as thy saints, the saints of God. Once the hand of God touches you, cleanses you, remolds you, and it breaks everything that needs to be broken in your life. By the time you come out of the hand of God, you become a saint, the saint of God. Acts chapter 9 verse 32. And it came to pass, as Peter passed through out all quarters, he came down also to the saints which dwelt at Leda. You see, it didn't matter where the saints, where the children of God were living, at Jerusalem or Leda. Whatever was going on around them, these were saints of God. Think about it this way. The white lily that grows in the dirty environment remains white because of the power of God. And the saint or the child of God is like that white lily. All the surrounding may be dirty. All the surrounding may be evil and may be simple. But because the Lord has wrought within him by his grace, he becomes a saint. You see Colossae, Colossae was a place of idolatry. It was a place of heathenism and paganism. It was a place of evil and sin. It was a place where Judaism was confusing many people because we are told that at Colossae there were about 50,000 Jews that were propagating Judaism. And yet in that place of heathenism, of paganism, of idolatry and of Judaism, there were these people that were touched and remolded by the Lord, and they became saints of the Lord. In Acts chapter 26, Acts chapter 26, verse 10, which sin also I did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice to them, against them. Paul the Apostle here testified, he said, before I became converted, I persecuted those people. But they were always saints. I never had them curse. I never had them abuse. I never had them deny the Lord. I never had them compromise. Even when they were imprisoning, they were still saints. Saintly life, saintly thought, saintly imagination, saintly language, saintly appearance, saintly lifestyle. Paul the Apostle said, I could recognize them. 
because anywhere I came across them, when I was going to imprison them, when I imprisoned them, when they were being persecuted, even when they were dying, their language never changed. They were saints of God. Everything within and without was saintly. They were holiness unto the Lord. That is the calling of the believer. That is the real name and the real nature and the real lifestyle of the true believer. In Romans chapter 1 and in verse 7. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. You see our calling? You see the, thing, the reason why God has called us into the kingdom? is to have a change of life. Some people will say that they are members of the church and they are still sinners. They say, well, the only difference between me, between them, and the people outside is that the other people outside are sinning and they are enjoying it. But they will say they are now children of God. They are sinning, but they don't enjoy it. No, not at all. You are called to be saints, not to be sinners, not to be dirty people. Our calling is a calling unto holiness to all that be in Rome called to be saints and that is our calling if that is our calling our life must match our calling our language must mark must match our calling we must be asking ourselves how does a saint talk how does a saint walk how does a saint dress how does a saint have thoughts how what thoughts will a saint allow accept meditate upon in his own heart how does a saint pray? How does a saint read the word of God? How does a saint follow the Lord? How does a saint follow after the things of the Lord? If we are saints, we should be interested in how saints live. How saints talk. How saints do whatever they ought to do. Our calling is to make us the saints of God. Ephesians chapter 1. Reading from verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. You will see here, Paul, the apostle uses two descriptions to describe the people that belong to God at Ephesus. He said, number one, the saints which are at Ephesus. Number two, to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Let us see Colossians chapter 1 verse 2. And see that this is the same way he described the people at Colossae. Chapter 1 verse 2 of Colossians. To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, in Christ, which are at Colossae. What does this mean? Number one, the saints refer to our relationship with God. It refers to the work God has done in us, on us, in our lives. It refers to what we become as the hand of the Lord has touched us and molded us. Think about it this way. It's a vertical relationship to the Lord. We have been rightly related with the God of heaven. And because of that, we become saints. Then it says, brethren. What does that mean? That describes our relationship with one another. Saints is our vertical relationship with Almighty God. And the brethren is our horizontal relationship with one another. When we are born again, we become children of God. Enmity is broken down. Fighting, malice, all that is broken down. Unforgiving spirit, all that is broken down. Malice, all that is taken away. I will not greet you, you will not greet me. I will not have anything to do with you, you will not have anything to do with me. All that is broken down. Now we are brethren. Saints, false. Because except God changes you, Except God changes me, we cannot be related together in the proper way. But if God has changed you, if God has changed me, then we become brethren and we become faithful brethren. We become faithful unto the Lord who has called us. And we know that the calling he has called us is to live holy lives. And because we love him, because we honor him, because we cherish the calling he has given us, we are faithful unto him. Not only that, we have received the gospel. And we become faithful to the gospel. We are not going to modify the gospel or destroy the gospel or take anything away out of the gospel. We are not going to add anything to it. We are not going to subtract anything away from it. We are faithful to the word he has given us. Not only that, we are faithful to all our vows and consecrations. You see, when we come to the Lord, we talk to the Lord. When we come to the Lord, we make promises to the Lord. When we come to the Lord, we say, Lord, 
Jesus died for us on the cross of Calvary. If you will forgive me, if you will change my life, if you will turn my life, I surrender everything to you, I will never go back. All things that were gained to me, I count everything as dung and draws. And if we are really children of God, we remain faithful brethren. I've opened my mouth unto the Lord, I cannot go back. Temptation will come. Harassment of the devil will come. There will be many things that will be wanting to uh, kick us back or make us to turn back. But we will say, I want to be faithful unto the Lord. I have opened my mouth unto the Lord in consecration and vow. And I cannot go back. We will also become faithful to one another. Because as we relate to one another, husband and wife, that's the relationship. Brothers and sisters, that's the relationship. Brother to brother, that's a relationship. A prayer partner to a prayer partner, that's a relationship. As people that have had the grace of God, and as people that are trusted in the church of God, and things are committed into our hands because of the relationship we have with one another, we ought to be faithful to one another. And this is what Paul was re reminding the children of God at Colossae. He said, you are to be saved. That's your vertical relationship with the Lord. You are also to be brethren and faithful brethren. Your horizontal relationship with one another to the saints and to the faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae. Now what do we know about Colossae? From the books that have been preserved for us, from the uh, writings of uh, the historians concerning Colossae, we learn that Colossae was already in existence by the year 500 B.C. And that it was a city in Asia Minor. It wasn't a famous city. We are told that it was famous for the deposit of shore. That uh, the waves of the sea near that city will be bringing to the shore. And because of that, the people try to see what they could make out of that. And they will make dyes out of that deposit of shore from the sea. They were also popular for their idolatry. I don't mean the church. I mean Colossae as a city. They were popular for their heathenism, for their paganism. And yet, it is wonderful that even though Colossae was an idolatrous place, even though it was a place of darkness and sin and evil, yet there was a church there. And the people there were referred, the people in the church were referred to as saints and the faithful brethren. We also told that Paul the apostle actually never went there. He didn't preach the gospel there to start the church. How was the church started there? When Paul the Apostle was at Ephesus, then from Ephesus, he covered Asia Minor. People were coming from Hierapolis, from uh, Laodicea, from, uh, from Colossae, and from all the surrounding of Asia Minor. And as they received the gospel, they went back and they preached the gospel in all those places. That is how the gospel came to Colossae. But let's learn something here. Even though Paul the Apostle had not been at Colossae himself, Yet he had apostolic authority on the church at Colossae. How and why? The teachers and the pastors and instructors at the Colossian church, they were the people that had received the knowledge of the gospel through Paul. They were the people that had received the instruction of righteousness through Paul the apostle. And because he had contributed into their lives and through the zeal, through the fire, through the light, through the knowledge, through the wisdom, through the gospel implanted into their lives, they took to Colossae and planted the church. Because of that, Paul, the apostle, had authority on them and authority on the church at Colossae. It's the same thing today. You come here to the Bible study, or you come here to the central church, the headquarters church here, and I contribute to your life. I build you up. And through the message you are hearing here at the church, at the headquarters church of Deeper Life, you have the fire within you, the zeal within you, the knowledge of the gospel within you. Then you go to Colossae, or you go to any other place to plant the gospel. I may never be at Colossae myself. I may never be at that place where I planted the gospel myself. But because I contributed your, to your life, I instructed you and trained you and brought you up, and you went over there, I have apostolic authority over you and over the church over there, which God has used you or helped you to plant. Now we have looked at the introductory uh, part of the epistle to the Colossians. What now can we say is the purpose to the, of the epistle to the Colossians? Why did he write the epistle? And why are we studying the epistle today? I told you earlier in the, in the earlier part of the message 
that there was the danger of philosophic science coming to the people at Colossae. And some of the people were about to be confused so that they will not be confused because of that kind of philosophy and science coming upon them. That is why he wrote the epistle to them. If you will look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. You see the danger of people thinking that they've got some secret knowledge some scientific knowledge, some philosophic knowledge, and they will not know that Christ is all and in all, that Christ is sufficient. Because of that a danger, he wrote the epistle to them. You know, right here today, all over the world, there is the invention coming up. There's scientific material coming up. And there are many scientific books coming up. In fact, we're told that in one year alone, you have about 16 million pages of science, scientific discovery. And what if you put all the scientific disruption of one day together, it will be difficult for a single man to study it all his lifetime. That is how fast science is growing today. And many people will think that because of technology and because of science, there is nothing to the Christian faith. The more you study the epistle to the Colossians, you will see that Christ is still all and in all. In Colossians chapter 1 verse 16, For by him were all things created that are in heaven, and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. I told you earlier, there was the danger of ecumenism at Colossae. The point is this, there were hidden people, there were pagan people, there were Judaizers, that is the people that believed in the law of Moses. And this Christian group, Christian church was there, and there were people that were running about to bring confusion, to tell them we're all approaching the same God. Everything should come together. The Judaizers and the Christians and the pagans, they should find a common forum whereby they'll be able to discuss their faith. But Paul the Apostle wrote to them, and he told them there can be no unity apart from Christ, that the center of everything is Christ. Because now when you are born again and you are a child of God, Edenism is gone, Judaism is gone, all those things are gone. Now Christ is all in all. That is why he wrote to them in chapter 2, from verse 16. Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of an holiday, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days, which are shadow of things to come. But the body is of Christ. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshipping of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly popped up by his flesh. And then in chapter 3, verse 11, where, the, where, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor circumcision, barbarians, kith and bond or free, but Christ is all and in all. He told them that the basis for unity can only be Christ. The basis for unity can only be the truth of the gospel. The basis for unity can only be that the circumcision, the uncircumcision, and the Greek, and the Jew, and all those people, they have seen their error. And they now come to Christ as Savior and Lord of their lives. I told you that some people were resisting authority. And they, they were coming to the church, and they were likely to uh, give them the danger of being under nobody's control, under nobody's teaching. That is why he emphasized in Colossians chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, by the will of God, he told them there's still authority, apostolic authority. And he said it didn't come from earth, it came from heaven. You know, some people at the Colossian church were told in the history of that place that they were coming with a lot of things. And they will say, after all, when something is pragmatic, that means when it is practical and it is working, everybody should take it. And they will say, if the worship of angels is pragmatic, is working, when we try it, it's bringing results, why don't you do it? If Judaism is bringing results, and when you do it, you discipline the flesh, you do this, you do that, it will work, why not take it? That's why Paul the Apostle wrote to them. And he told them in verse 18, which we have read already, Colossians chapter 2, let no man beguile you of your voluntary, of your reward in voluntary humility, of the worshipping of angels. And then he told them in verse 20, Wherefore, 
If ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are ye subject to ordinances, touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and the doctrines of men? He was fighting against the inroad or the incoming of Judaism. They had problem with frustrated relationship. And there were a frustrated relationship between parents and children, between husbands and wives, between servants and masters. And therefore he corrected them and he told them how things ought to be. Chapter 3, verse 18, he talks about wife towards husband. Verse 19, husbands toward their wives. Verse 20, children towards their, uh, towards their parents. And uh, verse 21, parents toward fathers towards their children. And then in verse 22, servants towards the master. And in chapter 4, verse 1, masters towards their servants. He corrected how the relationship should be. Some of them were also being confused on eschatology. On events of the last days of things to come. What shall we be? Are they going to spend all their lifetime on earth here? Are they going to be forever here? Is Christ ever coming back? And he tried to correct them and correct the erroneous notions they had among them. In chapter 3, verse 4, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear. Then shall ye also appear with him in glory. In all this, the Paul, the apostle wrote to the Colossians, he wanted to establish them. He wanted to perfect them so that they will not be moved away from the hope of the gospel that had been given unto them. That's why we read in Colossians chapter 1 and in verse 23, if ye continue in the faith, grounded, settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature, which is under heaven, where I, Paul, am made a minister. The purpose of writing this epistle to them is so that with all the confusion coming in, with all the erroneous things coming in, with all the apostles presenting themselves in a Colos at Colossae, they will not be moved away from the hope of the gospel that had been delivered unto them. Epaphras had been praying for them. And Paul the Apostle knew that the major point, the major request of Epaphras in the prayer he was praying for the church at Colossae was that they will be established and settled and perfected and matured. And to help in getting them settled and perfected and matured, he wrote the epistle to them in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 12. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluted you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. And the reason we want to have an in-depth study of this epistle is that by the grace of God, those of us who have been saved will be established in the Lord, will be matured in the Lord, will be perfected in the Lord. You see, when the wind is blowing fiercely, there are a lot of trees that will be bending. And a lot of their fruits will be wasted because they will be blown up by the wind. And sometimes some of the trees will crack and fall down. And there, are, there is much wind blowing today. Wind, wind of pretended scientific knowledge. Wind of ecumenism. Wind of resistance against authority. Wind of pragmatism, of frustrated relationship. And winds of erroneous teaching on eschatology. When you study Colossians, you'll be established. You'll be matured. You'll be perfected. And whatever wind may be blowing, you will abide and your fruit will abide. I want to encourage you that in the few weeks ahead of us, while we go in depth into the epistle to the Colossians, that you will come, you will encourage other people who do not know we have started a new study, you will encourage them to come. And by the grace of God, we shall be established in the Lord. Today we have learned of the grace of God, of the peace of God. Today we have learned that whatever we are going to become should not be by usurpation, should not be by aspiration or nomination, should be by the will of God. Today we have learned that our calling is to call us as saints and to be faithful brethren unto the Lord. Have a vertical relationship with God and a horizontal relationship with one another. Today we have learned that even though Colossae was a bad place, an evil place, an idolatrous place, these people were still able to grow up like white lilies. And we too, even though our surroundings may be dirty and sinful, the grace of God, the power of God, and the blood of Jesus Christ and so cleanse us and make us white as lilies, saintly and holy and righteous, 
Today we have learned that even though there are winds blowing all around that will make people unstable, the Lord wants us to be established and stable, settled and matured, perfected and firm in the Lord. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer that God will help us. That all the purpose for which this epistle was written will be fulfilled in your life, will be fulfilled in my life. Talk to the Lord in prayer. We are called to be saints. We are called to be saints. Saintly language, saintly walk, saintly talk, saintly dress, saintly thought, saintly imagination, saintly lifestyle. Called to be saints and faithful brethren. Called to be saints and faithful brethren. Let's pray that God will give us his grace. He will multiply his peace in our lives. And will make us the people we ought to be.